Welcome to the creative community. I'm your host, David Starkey, and my guest this time is Jonathan Fox, the artistic director of Ensemble mm -hmm. Theatre Company. Uh, great to have you. Great to be back. <laughs> you it's know, been, uh, what, six years? Six years, and I'm just thinking it's really almost seven years uh, this spring wow. when we lasted the show, and uh, I missed you. Yeah. But you know, I was um, looking at some video clips from previous interviews, and I have to say, I was so somnolent that I started to put myself to sleep. <laughs> so I really swore I was going to be more energetic you know, we're gonna today. You up a little <laughs> yeah. bit. I thought you were going to say, you know, I look so young or you know, I was so happy but yeah, I was yes. <laughs> There's that too. <laughs> well, it's great to have you back and um, you know, the the show went on hiatus and sort of uh, shifted to a different format around the time that you guys were looking for a new space, right? Yeah. Um, tell us about well, that for people who have been out of Santa Barbara for the last six years. Sure. Well, you know, I joined the company now 13 and a half years ago, and uh, we were in um, a 140-seat space, the Alacama, which mm -hmm. the company had been in. We're now in our 41st season. Wow. And the company had been in that space for, I would say, at least... 30 years by the time I joined, or wow. just about 30 years. But we set out to find a new space because we felt that it was really limiting as to what we could do. Mm -hmm. and just up there on <coughs> stage, yeah. Just the fact that it was uh, a small space, a small stage. Yeah. Uh, the we, chairs were uncomfortable. <laughs> the chairs were uncomfortable. I mean, we did great work there. We did some really gorgeous set designs, yeah, et cetera. Yeah, we really but did. It, we couldn't really do a full-scale musical mm -hmm. or uh, anything that was technologically advanced. Okay. So um, we set about to uh, raise the money, find this new space, uh, um, and do the construction renovations. And we took the Victoria Hall Theater and created the new Vic, which is a 300-seat theater. Mm -hmm. Uh, Great place Victoria's to watch a play, too. Oh, it's wow. really terrific. Uh, I mean, it's the perfect size for us. Mm -hmm. It's it's not too large, and um, we've had several performances that have sold out. Mm -hmm. So it, it's a it's a good size to accommodate our audiences mm -hmm. as well. Yeah. Well, we're gonna um, take a look. I think uh, the very first shot we got some images that we're gonna we're gonna scroll mm -hmm. through, and I think the first one is from the, the first show that, that you guys did. Mm -hmm. Is that correct? Um, I think so. Let's pull it up and see. What yeah, we're gonna, a yeah. little night music. So. We opened in 2013. Well, first of all, we opened with a big gala event to open the building, and Tyne Daly sang and performed in that event, wow. and she was amazing. And Eva Marie Saint read a poem that was written for the occasion. Um, and this is a little night music, and you're not seeing on here Piper Laurie, who played uh, Madame Armfelt uh, in the show, but that is Stephanie Zimbalist, and Patrick Cassidy was in the show. And um, that was this uh, our, our kicker. kicker yeah, and yeah, you know when you when you look at it and then you try and um, think back to the the previous uh, theater, you can see just how much more room you had. Um, yes, so it's a much bigger space, it's deeper, deeper, and we have a state of the art what's called a fly system, which mm -hmm. is the what raise the mechanics that raise uh, scenery up and down, mm -hmm. and so those things what you're looking at, which are kind of like clouds, those were actually. Li um, raised up during uh, the, the end of the first act, mm -hmm. which is what you're seeing here. But that was a, a real fun production. Let's take a look at the, yeah. the next image we have. Oh, and so again in our first season, so one of the wonderful things about the, the new space is there's a space below the stage that we can use. And so we actually built uh, a, a swimming pool in there that uh, the entire show took place in the swimming pool. And this was Metamorphoses, uh, adapted from the Ovid uh, tales uh, by Mary Zimmerman. Mm -hmm. And um, that was a technological feat, I have to say. Uh, the water was recycled through bins below the stage. <laughs> wow. uh, there was, if you look at the gentleman sitting down in the upper left corner of the screen, he actually had hay 
in, in this as part of his costume. Right, right. And after the show closed, we found hay growing below <laughs> uh, in the dressing rooms because the seeds got down right. in the water. So. And do I remember that there were places where people could sort of like hide underneath the edges or, or am I misremembering? Uh, there was, you can't really see it from here, but uh, there was sort of an infinity pool uh, aspect uh -huh. because there were steps going down oh, okay. below. Uh, and we had to get ponchos for people sitting in the front row right, right. because Warning the signs, water yeah. would uh -huh. splash sure. all over yeah. them. Yeah, yeah, it was it was fun. Yeah, that's part of the fun. <laughs> yeah, 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 that's what I mean. Though is uh, this uh, new space really allowed us to 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 uh, expand the kind of work that we so, do? So yeah, so that was good. that was the question I was going to ask. Is you do automatically think okay, let's think bigger? Mm -hmm. uh -huh. I did. Yeah. And you know, one of the things I, I, I'm always curious about is, is where you get your plays. And I know a lot of them mm -hmm. have premiered in New York. Um, I actually saw that play, Metamorphoses, in, in Chicago mm -hmm. at the Looking Glass Theater. Mm -hmm. um, d you, you're bringing a <coughs> lot of really fantastic plays right here to town. I don't know, how, how are you finding them? So some of it is uh, seeing something in New York uh -huh. uh, or London. Uh, some of it is just keeping an eye out on what other regional theaters are doing that I've never heard of. Okay. So uh, last season we did a play called Everything is Illuminated, which was an adaptation of the Jonathan Safran Foer novel, mm -hmm. which is one of my favorite writers. Yeah. And uh, when I saw that a, a small theater was doing it in DC, I contacted them and they said they were only the second theater to do it. Oh, wow. And it was tough to get the rights. I'd never heard of it. They sent me the adaptation. I liked it and uh, we were able to get the rights to do it. So there are some things like that and uh, some things that have been on my list of plays to do for years. Mm -hmm. um, uh, you know, I've been an artistic director of a theater for 25, 26 yeah, back years in now. New Jersey, right yeah. Before, yeah. Mm. So I've kept a list all those years. <laughs> <laughs> well, and how difficult is, I mean, d does it often happen where you say, oh, I really want to do this, but it's just out of our, our reach? Yes, a lot. Uh -huh. uh, there are wonderful plays, uh, wonderful classic plays that have a cast of 20. Okay. And that really is beyond our, our uh, capability uh, financially. Mm -hmm. Not uh, The building can accommodate it. The dressing rooms can accommodate mm -hmm. it. But uh, that's a huge uh chunk because we are a union theater we have a contract with the actors union mm -hmm. and, and and that can get very expensive the other thing too is we sometimes go for the rights to something and we can't get them mm -hmm. because off we, we're, we're even though we're a hundred miles from LA they still consider us part of the LA market okay so and they don't want to dilute that somehow. Yeah, yeah and in fact uh, I applied for the rights to a play next season uh, that came out 10 years ago, so you'd think it would be not a difficult thing, mm -hmm. but as it turns out, there is a new production opening in New York and uh, with stars, mm -hmm. and we are not able to get the rights, and I think it's a, one of the big theaters down in LA is planning to bring that show. Okay, yeah. yeah. Well, and that has to be really frustrating. It's frustrating, because yeah. you can't really control it. It's right. basically, you're sort of at the mercy of what the forces are down, down, down in LA. Mm -hmm. Let's take a look at the, the next uh, image that we're kind of looking, scrolling back through. This is Macbeth. Yeah, right? this is Macbeth. Uh, y you're not seeing it in this photo, but uh, the uh, one of the interesting things we did with this was uh, we used 3D uh, video projection. So we had several uh, cameras around the theater and also uh, created uh, video projection on the walls and on other surfaces to create the illusions and magic so the witches uh, literally disappeared into the walls and yeah, people nice. were like how did they do this <laughs> and the dagger of course was floating and uh -huh. so uh, that was a, a way for us to kind of expand technologically uh, uh, which I think is a big thing you know, oh absolutely you know. and we're gonna see that later on mm -hmm. and just to, to stay on Macbeth I happen to be teaching that in uh, at City College right now as a director what are the biggest challenges uh, for that, for that play well, I think you have to uh, figure out who these witches are, mm -hmm. and you have to uh, also, the play is done a lot, and so you want to try and do something that is going to capture the imagination. Okay. Uh, I mean, the language is fantastic, and the language is also very complex. I mean, it's, n it's not an early career play for Shakespeare, it was middle, and uh, he was getting into a period where he was really expanding his, uh, really trying something um, pretty courageous mm -hmm. with, with language. Mm -hmm. And so a lot of the text in Macbeth
Macbeth, even though it's a, one of his most popular plays, is very complex and uh, yeah. not that easy to pick up. Well, and one of the things that my students actually yesterday were commenting on is how compact it is and how quickly mm -hmm. you move from one thing to the yeah. next, one motive to the next, and, and how quickly things ratchet up. And, and that's got to be hard to do on stage. And in a film, you know, you can cut away and indicate that time's passed, but in a play, it's, it's going like yeah. that. Well, and I think that's why it's done quite a lot, mm -hmm. because it's only two hours. Right. <laughs> uh, and uh, you don't have to cut very much in uh -huh. order to keep it to a con for a contemporary audience. Right, right. But I found when we were working on it, I found that the actors wanted to move very fast through it. And my job was to slow them yeah, down a little bit uh -huh. and try to keep it to, and try to make sure we're not jumping over pauses mm -hmm. that help the audience sort of figure out what these moments are all yeah. about. You know, and uh, there was a, a thought, I think, when I first moved to Santa Barbara, that there wasn't a lot of Shakespeare here in, in town, probably mm -hmm. not. Is, is there any a special difficulty for drawing an audience, or is that a, a big draw, or how does that work? Well, I think Macbeth was a big draw. Yeah. Uh, we just did Measure for Measure, which was not a big draw, right. and I think so. I think if you're doing one of the big ones, okay. Hamlet, uh, Romeo and Juliet, potentially, then you might, you might, it might be more uh, audience friendly. Uh -huh. Uh, we chose Measure for Measure, which I think, we're, yeah, we'll here's, a, look at, here's yeah. a photo of it yeah. right now, uh, because of the Me Too subject matter, mm -hmm. uh, you know, it's a story about uh, a, a young novitiate, she's about to become a nun, whose brother is imprisoned for uh, the crime of fornication, basically, he mm -hmm. gets his fiancée pregnant without, uh, before the marriage. And she uh, goes to try to re get his release, and the deputy says, I'll release him if you sleep with me. And uh, so very, very uh, 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 courageous play, uh, although it was a tale that Shakespeare knew very well. And um, so when we did it, I really, as you saw in the, in the photo, uh, uh, those video screens, uh, for me it was, uh, the, the interesting thing was that we're living in this age, and I don't know if you saw the article in the New York Times on Sunday, about a facial recognition and how we're at the point where if you have the right yeah. glasses, you can, t walking down the street, see someone's name and their address mm -hmm. and, and mm -hmm. all about them. Right. And that's a freaky kind of thing. And so this uh, production, I tr capitalized a little bit on that oh, yeah. sense in the government of what this government was like at that it time. It was a very voyeuristic play. Yes, it well. was, yeah. yeah. So those screens doubled as monitors and strip joints, but also internal for internal soliloquies, seeing their faces. Yeah. And this is seen right here, what you're seeing is a sort of a sequence that is actually not technically in the play, it's talked about. This is the scene where uh, Isabella, where someone goes in Isabella's place to have the, uh, the tryst sexual encounter, yeah. with, uh, with the deputy uh, and this was, uh, we decided to present it uh, mm -hmm. in a video form. Yeah. yeah, I thought that was really good. And mm -hmm. in the course, of the, the play famously ends on a, a marriage that's not necessarily the most joyful. It just, it seems like one, one person of power taking over for somebody yeah. else. Yeah, that's the, I think, something that a director and the actress uh, have to really make a decision about because it is one of those amazing endings uh, that are that's ambiguous when you read right, it. So yeah. basically, for those who don't know or didn't see it, the Duke seems to be a very benevolent uh, leader who's gone off in disguise and comes back right. and helps Isabella out uh, ultimately. And uh, the very last moment, he says, "And you'll be my wife." And he takes her hand. <laughs> she and saw that her. is, and she has no right. language, no text after that. No so text. for the last yeah. several minutes, it's him talking to everyone else, and she is completely silent. Right. So is he forcing himself on her? Is it a happy ending? It could right. be done in several different yeah. ways. And and uh, what was your interpretation? Um, that? I could not see doing it as a happy ending. Yeah, because. <laughs> <laughs> she didn't look too happy up there on stage. Uh, and and it, it's, it's it too, because it's so, rather than, you know, a, a, the tragedies of Shakespeare where people get killed and then one person speaks for, you know, the continuance yeah. of, of order, this just seems to clamp everything down, yes. you know? Well, I mean, especially in this kind of production, which was so dystopian. Right, it really was. There are productions that are much more 
uh, lean much more towards the comic. Uh -huh. And then there are productions that completely cut the comedy out. Right. They cut out all those comic characters because their main focus is really on the darker, tragic right. Uh, right. part of the play. It's a very unusual play. It really is. Yeah. Sui generis. Yeah. Let's take a look at uh, the next image. I'm not sure what we've got. No. Porgy oh, and Bess. Porgy and Bess, yeah. So Porgy and Bess was our largest show, but also uh, our biggest ticket seller in ensemble's history, uh, as far as we could tell based on reports. But basically, we reduced this huge opera uh, down to a 14-person cast and a six-person jazz band. Uh -huh. we, we received permission from the Gershwin estate to do this on a one-time basis where we adapted the music, uh, as a, so did, we did it as a jazz musical. And we used the script from the recent Broadway production that was adapted by Susan Laurie Parks that was less uh, recitative, you know, sung mm -hmm. dialogue mm -hmm. and more spoken dialogue. Mm -hmm. So we were looking for performers who were both wonderful singers but also wonderful actors mm -hmm. as opposed to uh, when you do an opera, it's more mostly about the singing. Yeah. And, uh, and we found them. They, we had some excellent, excellent uh, actors. And what you're seeing is basically Porgy and Bess in the middle there. And uh, they were both terrific uh, in the show. There was, since we're alluding to New York periodicals, yeah. there was a longish um, piece in the New York Review of Books about Porgy and Bess. I don't know if you mm -hmm. read that or not, I but they, not. they're mm -hmm. talking about how one approaches the language. Um, mm -hmm. You know, do you use the language that was initially in the novel and in, in the text of the of the uh, libretto, or do you modernize it? And what, what yeah. was your? Well, so in the original, of course, you know, which was written by white people, uh, it, was. it uh, was a very sort of heavy, uh, stereotypical dialect mm -hmm. that uh, uh, a lot of people rightly find offensive today. Uh, what Susan Laurie Parks did was she cleaned a lot of that up, so it wasn't. Uh, it wasn't Offensive. like that. Okay. Now, when the lyrics of, of the songs, we took, we did the same thing. Okay. So, um, uh, which a lot of contemporary singers, when they sing those sure. songs, yeah. will do the same thing. You know, they will take out the dems and the does and, mm -hmm. and that kind mm -hmm. of thing, and, and put in, and, and sort of do it the way it, you know. Right. Contemporary and you still get to keep it. Gershwin's music. <laughs> yeah, and you still get to keep Gershwin's yeah, music, yeah. right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's great. Yeah. Let's see what we have next uh, as we, uh, we're strolling down memory lane memory here lane. at the great. Ensemble Theater. It. Company people walking in. Yeah. This is Jonathan Fox, obviously. Um, this is Husbands and Wives, Husbands right? Husbands and Wives, yeah. On a whim, I reached out to uh, Woody Allen's attorney to see if we could get the rights to adapt Husbands and Wives for the stage uh, here. And... The attorney passed it on to, uh, I'm sorry, the attorney, uh, I, I contacted his agent first. His agent passed it on to his attorney, and I fully expected him to say no. Mm -hmm. uh, his attorney emailed me and said, can you come down to uh, Beverly Hills and meet with me and his manager? Uh, and so I drove down, and I thought, well, if they ask me how you're going to do it, what are you going to say? Right. And I started to think about the use of video screens because the movie has a, uh, is very much done like a documentary, right. and uh, you see quick cuts and all that sort of thing, and I start to think, well, how would you do it on stage? And I start to think it would be kind of cool to show video of people even when they're off stage. So you're seeing kind of a reaction of someone who's not even on stage mm. to something that's happening on stage. And so I made the pitch. They really liked it. They talked to Woody Allen. And they said to me, you know, he gets these requests all the time. He always says no. The only other time he said yes was Bullets Over Broadway, and that was a Broadway production. Mm -hmm. Lo and behold, he said yes. Uh, we did it. It was a world premiere. I adapted it. And uh, he sent me a really lovely oh, awesome. uh, note of thanks. Yeah. Uh, he wasn't able to come out to see it because he was in the middle of shooting a movie. But he said, I heard great things. And um, right. so, yeah, it was a really exciting project. Well, anyway, we've been seeing all this this use of technology. Um, I'm I'm curious now when you are 
envisioning what a play is going to look like on stage, uh, that's part of it now, right? Is how will I use the, the, the technology? Yes, and if you see here, this is another shot. Um, we also had pouring rain going on, which is a big plot point mm -hmm. in the um, in the film. In the film, mm. and uh, but it is indeed uh, we take all those considerations in mind, and and uh, so so I'm always thinking, well, is there a way to do this that maybe incorporates some new technology, or if not, maybe it's just better to do it simply. Mm -hmm. uh, but um, are you, are you working with one particular person each time? Is there somebody on on staff, or when you when you're thinking, I want to try and do this, this, and this? Um, well, we have an excellent production team. Okay. Uh, who are on staff and they act as advisors as to what they think technologically we can do. In addition to that, we often hire um, uh, set designers, video designers uh, to, to work with us. So for Measure for Measure, uh, that was Ben Kropp we hired from, uh, who's on the staff of City College as our video designer. So he put all that video mm -hmm. together and mm -hmm. got the cameras and uh, it must have been a lot of work. <laughs> it was, but it was a relatively smooth uh. process. I will tell you a funny story, though. Uh, in the two previews, uh, the, some, for some reason the video kept cutting off, right. shutting down two minutes before 8 o'clock. <laughs> <laughs> and we were frantically trying to reboot, and the audience was waiting, and, and it was really uncomfortable, and we could not figure out what, what it was. What the heck was going on, yeah. Uh, on opening night, before, an hour before opening, our stage manager said, I really think it's the walkie-talkie I use. And she, they did it 10 times, and each time she pressed the walkie-talkie, the video would cut out. <sighs> We have no, even <laughs> still, my. Just one walkie talkie. Even still, everyone is skeptical that that was actually, the, but it never happened again because you never used the walkie talkie. Yeah, all right, <laughs> get rid of that walkie talkie. And that happened really just before showtime again. So oh, that's yeah. funny. Um, let's see, what else have we got here? And um, we should say that, that you and I are talking here in, in sort of late January of. 2020. Mm -hmm. So uh, the first part of your season has already passed, um, uh, but we want to talk about what's coming up next. Right. We um, we started with Measure for Measure, uh, which we we saw uh, some photos of, and also we ha we just closed a, a, a holiday show. It was a staged version of like a radio uh, play version of It's a Wonderful Life. Mm -hmm. Five actors played all the characters, but that was a real audience. Hit. So they were fantastic, very versatile actors, a lot of fun, and um, so that was our holiday show. And we are in rehearsals right now for uh, a musical adaptation of the Jane Austen novel Emma, okay. which uh, is um, you know a, a very popular novel about a woman who is uh, kind of gets into people's business, and uh -huh. she thinks she knows what's best for her friends and whom they should marry. Uh, until she discovers, spoiler alert, she discovers that maybe she doesn't know <laughs> what's best yeah, right. uh, after all, and maybe she should just focus on herself. So this um, is an adaptation of the novel by Paul Gordon, okay. who a composer who wrote uh, the musical Daddy Long Legs, which I think a number of people uh, would in this area yeah. will have seen, because okay. the Rubicon uh, did that uh, down in Ventura. Um, and we have a wonderful cast led by Samantha Eggers, who is playing the title role of Emma, and Kevin Early, who is playing Knightley, her, who ends up being her, her bow, love yeah. interest. Yeah. yeah. <clears throat> so that per the performances start in early February, February 6th, and they'll run through pretty much the, the month of February. Okay, mm -hmm. and then after that, what have you got? After that, we are doing the West Coast premiere of the play American Sun, which uh, was on Broadway uh, about a year uh, ago. And it is about, uh, so what happens before the play starts is uh, uh, an African-American teenager has been arrested uh, by the police overnight, uh, a, a traffic stop. Her, his mother goes to the uh, precinct to try to get information on her son and uh, she uh, is stonewalled. His father, again, a little bit of a spoiler here, uh, who's Caucasian, uh, shows up. And so the play becomes about how each of them is being treated a little differently by mm -hmm. the police. Mm -hmm. 
and about what a black teenager has to think about before, you know, um, in this day and age, vis-a-vis mm -hmm. -vis, uh, um, police force. Okay. So it's a, it, it's a really gripping play. The plot is very, very tight. It takes place in real time. So it's a 90-minute play oh, cool. that starts at 4 in the morning, mm -hmm. and you kind of see the clock on the mm -hmm. wall. And they are desperate to try and find information, um, bef you know, mm -hmm. um, which they're having trouble getting. Yeah. It's always a, a difficult thing to do in, in real time because um, the suspense is built in there, but you've got to keep people's interest in, in ways that maybe that real that's, life wouldn't necessarily do that. That's right. Um, and actually, this uh, production is a... Uh, is a co-production with the English Theater of Frankfurt in Germany. Wow. So since I was last on the show, we have done, this is our third collaboration with them. Uh, two years ago, we did Invisible Hand uh, as a collaboration, and two years before that, we did Bad Jews uh, and took that to Germany. Mm -hmm. I'm looking down at, at our time. We've just got about 90 seconds. Can you believe oh it? Oh my gosh. Well, let's do the last show very quickly. <laughs> All right, let's, do, let's see what we have. Uh, one our more. last show is Tenderly, which is a bio musical of Rosemary Clooney. Uh, it is, Rosemary will be played by Linda Pearl, uh, who, a lot, who a lot of people sure, will remember yeah. from television. And she was in our production of uh, Year of Magical Thinking several years ago. And it's a two character play. Someone plays Rosemary, and a man plays all the other characters, her doctor, her sister, her man manager, all that. And it's a really cool, lovely uh, musical uh, about her and her very tricky, challenging life that she had. And, and that will be playing? That's playing in June. In June, okay. Yeah. Well, um, boy, I feel we, we're caught oh up. Oh my gosh, <laughs> yes. I didn't even get to mention our education programming. <laughs> All well, the program we have the actors classes and the kids program. Yeah, and you have been so, doing yeah. a lot of that. I've noticed. Yeah. So people who are, are interested in that can go to your website, yes. which is etcsb.org. Etcsb.org. Etcsb .org. So an so. ensemble theater company yeah. in Santa Barbara. All right. Mm -hmm. Well, it, we're not going to wait another six years before uh, I talk to you again, well, Jonathan. Great, yeah. we'll, we'll, let's do it again next year. Thank you again. So Thanks much for, for having being me. On the show. It's great to be here. The Creative Community is produced in Santa Barbara with a generous grant from the Diana and Simon Robb Foundation. I'm your host, David Starkey, and we'll see you.